week two of a series called Picture This. Last week we talked about vision and believing that life could be different. Like I said last week, when we talk about vision, some people panic because you think we're going to end up in a room with a bunch of people and a whiteboard coming up with bad ideas trying to land on the least bad idea, right? You just, that's, to me, that's uh, what some of those meetings are like. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about hope and purpose for your life. And let me tell you, it is not too much for you to ask the Lord for hope and purpose. Like that is not out of bounds for you. What God said to Jeremiah about having a hope and a good future is also true about you. He has plans for you. Every person that I have known beyond a cursory level, everybody that I've had any bit of relationship with, at some point has told me that they have felt stuck. I just feel like I'm stuck. I don't know where I'm going here. I don't know what's next. Maybe they had a traumatic experience. Maybe something happened they didn't anticipate. Maybe they're just tired, but they feel stuck. And being stuck without a hope or without a future is contrary to the life that Jesus has called you to. You were promised a lot of things. You were promised hope, a good future. You were promised friendship. You were promised contentment. But you were never promised a season of hopelessness. That is not what God has for you. Claiming Jesus and hopelessness at the same time is spiritual dissonance, and one of those has to go. And Jesus is not leaving. So let me just encourage you, if you feel that this morning, like, I, I just can't even see a way forward, it's not God's plan for you, and he wants to rectify it. Some of you don't like to talk about the future. You're like, I could barely make it through today. But thinking about the future is how we write history. And should the day come, generations back, if they ever look at us and go, we are so grateful for them, it'll be because we had vision for the future. So if you're stuck, that's not God's idea for you. God's picture for your future is glorious. Maybe in this world, it may be in the next. But we have a picture and we believe for that picture, come what may in the meantime. Because the meantime is not the last chapter of your life. Paul lived with this tension of these this, things happening to him that he didn't understand, but believing there was more. And he described it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10. We are afflicted in every way. It's like, how are you afflicted? Every way. But we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always carrying the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. The person who believes this verse has concrete hope no matter what comes. Yeah, things could get hard. Things could get confusing. We could be afflicted. We could be perplexed. We could be persecuted. But we are not finished off because we have hope. If you're old enough to have worked in the 90s. How many of you had a job in the 90s? Okay, you worked in the 90s. Some of you are just too young. You're like, I was in grade school. We don't want to hear it, okay? But we understand. Some of you worked in the 90s. If you worked in the 90s, it was a different world. They would print books that had everyone's phone number in it. And they would bring you that book. It was, like, it was like somebody hit print on the internet. It was like, they were all printed out. Uh, other things is in the 90s, you did not have a smartphone to keep your schedule. You had a, how many of you had a day timer? I, I knew David Carnes would be a day timer guy. You, you buy these expensive leather bound things and they, you buy the expensive, it was very expensive, but you, you did this. Also in the 90s, if you worked, everyone read the exact same book. You read Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits, of highly successful. How many of you read Stephen Covey? Okay. This morning, we're going to go a little bit Stephen Covey on you. Not entirely, because I think he's Mormon. But we are going to pull one thing out. <laughs> Some of you were nervous about that. No, just one thing. He had these seven habits of highly successful people. And the number two, don't, don't put it up there yet. Does anybody remember, remember what number two was? Oh, that's him. Noah, from the cheap seats. Begin with the end in mind. Yes, that was the second habit. He's into reading retro books. That was super impressive. <laughs> You're a little embarrassed even now that you knew it. it just, you didn't even think about it. It just came out of there. I think we're done now. Okay. No, Stephen Covey's second principle was begin with the end in mind. Think about where it's going and then work towards that way. And we're going to do that regarding this idea of favor. Okay? Beginning with the end in mind. To do that, I want to read a passage that will 
be dated far past what we're actually going to study, because we're looking at the end in mind. If you have your Bibles open, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22 for a second. By faith, Joseph, stop for a second, Joseph has been dead forever at this point. All right? Don't get confused. He's gone. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Near the end of Joseph's life, here's some of you like, oh, that's good. What does it mean? I don't know, but it's good. It is good because this verse is like hypertext, okay? There's something behind that. You know what hypertext is? It's like when there's a blue link on a website, you click it and there's something behind it. There are hundreds of years and millions of people behind this verse, That's what this is linked to. Joseph, at the time of his death, it's 300 years roughly before the death of Moses, he made mention of the exodus at his death. He goes, oh, by the way, when I die, take me with you when you go. He says that to people who will also die. Like, you realize, 300 years goes by, but he's putting a stake in the ground for the future. He says, no, 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 take me with you. It's like he gets this vision from God of the exodus And it comes in the form that nobody understands, but they go, okay, we'll take you with you us when we go. It's almost like if someone were to give you a baby elephant and you've never seen an elephant before. Can you imagine? Somebody gives you a baby elephant, you're like, wow, this thing's huge. (laughs) No, it will be huge. (laughs) Okay? This thing is expensive. Oh, it will be expensive. This thing makes messes. Oh, it will be messier than you possibly imagine. Because the vision that he receives, nobody understands how big this thing is. And this is all of our stories. Maybe not exactly like Joseph, but in the sense that we get a picture of what God wants to do. It's always bigger than we think it is instantly. It's always a little slower and takes longer than we think. And it's always messier than we hoped it would be. And God still has it all under control. Ephesians 3.20 says he is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think. So even when he speaks to us and said, hey, I think I have something for you, whatever you're picturing there is too small and too tidy and too clean and too easy. It's bigger, it's harder, it's messier. So that's what Joseph discovered about his life. Was his picture of the future accurate? Yes. Was it whole? Not remotely. In reality, it was far more abundant than what he would ever dreamed of. The fullness of him returning home to be buried with his forefathers was way bigger than he realized. And we're going to look at that entire arc of the story. Before I do, let's get, let me just warn you, prep here. How many of you know the name Ross Chastain? Nobody. Okay. Nobody, like I didn't, I've never heard of him until last Sunday. But last Sunday, while we were all napping, Ross Chastain was driving in a NASCAR race. Okay, some of you go, oh, now I've seen it. Yes, he was, and here's the important thing to know, he was in sixth place, but in order to go on to the next race, he had to be in fourth. Coming down the back stretch, he's on his radio with his spotter. He says, how many, point, how many places do I need to qualify for the next? They said, you need two places. He is four seconds behind. There's no way he's going to catch them. They were at the Martinsville Speedway. Martinsville's very slow. You run about 100 miles an hour on the straights, about 60 miles an hour around the corners. So what Ross Chastain did was what no one had ever done before, is on the back stretch, he reached from fourth gear into fifth gear, moved up to the wall, and at 130 miles an hour, stomped on the gas and took his hands off the wheel. And the car slingshotted around the track on the outside of the wall. As the others are on the inside of the track doing 60, he's doing 120 around the outside. Makes up the spot, goes from fourth, from sixth to fourth, qualifies for the next race, destroys his car, but wins. Later they asked him, what made you think that you could do that? He said, I played a lot of NASCAR 2005 on GameCube when I was a kid. And it works on the video game. I didn't know if it would work or not in real life. True story. He crosses the finish line at 120. Everybody else is doing 60. Now NASCAR's in a tizzy. What if somebody else tries it? Nobody is going to try this, okay? So we're going to pull a Ross Chastain this, this week, and we're going to cover 110 years in 35 minutes. Okay, so we're going to go a little fast. Hang on. Nobody's ever done fifth gear through the story before. 
Joseph's story is so full of fascinating little snippets that you could preach for a year on Joseph. But we're going to do this really fast because we're in our week two of our series of vision and we've got to do a very quick recap of last week. Last week we talked about the fact that vision matters. Lacking a picture for the future, one will be given to you. If you don't know what the Lord is saying for your future, your friends, your boss, your mother, the devil, I'm not putting them all in the same category. I'm just saying somebody will provide a picture for your future if the Lord doesn't give you one. We also talked about two really big ideas that we're going to use as guides through this, this series. The first one is that growing in Jesus requires an element of faith that goes beyond apologetics to exercise. In other words, it's not just enough to understand facts about Jesus. You have to encounter him. When you are under pressure, it is not enough to know his birthday and the last four of his social. Facts will not cut it. You've got to have an encounter with the Lord. The second big idea, and this sentence is a disaster, but you just have to bear with me. Building a congregation requires an element of faith that sees what others cannot so we can be what we would not if we didn't see it first. In other words, we just got to have faith for more. And maybe nobody else sees it. Nobody, but we, if, if we don't see more, we're never going to get there. I'm preaching to myself there as well. We talked last week about holy imagination, which is imagination that God gives you for other people. And how carnal imagination, you're always the center of your own story, but holy imagination, you begin to think of, okay, Lord, we, what you're giving me, why is it for, how can this affect others? So back to the end, or the verse that we started with, Hebrews eleven twenty two. Let me read it again. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. This passage, which comes near the end of our Bible, links to a passage way back near the beginning. In real time, Genesis 50, 24 to 26. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. You will carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, had this conversation happened early in his life, it's likely his brothers would have smiled, nodded, and left him there. Because there was some tension there. They didn't understand what he was talking about. But he says to them at the end of his life, my bones don't belong here. Take them back to the promised land. This passage comes on the heels of the death of Jacob, his father. There's, if you read the passage, you think it happens one after the other, but it's actually 50 years later. And what they do differently with Jacob is they actually take him and they, they take him up and they bury him in a cave. But with Joseph, they're not allowed to go, so they put him in a coffin. Most Bible translations, this is the only use of the word coffin in the Bible. You find the word coffin elsewhere you, if you read like the New Living, uh, not the New Living, the, uh, um, the Message Version, or uh, if you read paraphrases, they use the word coffin in other places. But this is the, the real hardcore translation. This is the only place they use the word coffin. Why do they put him in a coffin? You know, like you put a coffin in the ground. Not in this case. Tradition says they put him in a coffin and they set that on a stone slab. He said, put me in a box with handles. Because the day is coming when I want you to grab grandpa and scoot. I want you to take me with you when you go. And that actually happens. We, uh, we discover later on in the Bible, they actually take him and they bury him in Shechem in the land of his forefathers. So they do that. The picture that Joseph had of his future, being at rest with the Lord and all the Lord had done in his life, that picture involves a series of snapshots through his life. We're going to look at five of those really quickly this morning. Snapshots that make up the whole of the picture of Joseph's life that give him faith at the end of his life to say, take me home because I want to be buried in the promised land. And some of those snapshots, if that's all you saw, you would totally not understand what his life is about. And I would say to you that for the most part, we have dissected Joseph's life in so many little pieces and gotten good stories out. We've misapplied some of them or underapplied some of them. So we're going to look at five of these snapshots all together here. First snapshot, favor, but for more than you imagined. 
favor, but for more than you imagine. Uh, a couple of months ago, family moved into our subdivision, and they've got nine kids, which made them very popular with our kids, okay, because no longer are we the only big family with a, with a big van. And so they're great people. They're a uh, Catholic family, love Jesus deeply. And uh, we've had, uh, got to spend some time together. The father of the family, Gabriel and I, once in a while get a chance to go and we'll be out for a walk. We'll walk together. We talk about dad stuff. You know, we just talk about big vans and grills and, you know, things that dads talk about. And we talk about the Lord. And it's kind of fun because we have a lot of the similar ideas, but we have very different language because he comes, his father is actually one of the uh, premier Catholic theologians in the United States. He's not a priest, but he's a theologian. And so Gabriel is uh, very learned, and he has great language from a Catholic perspective about things. And, and uh, of course, I came up out of the Pentecostal movement. You know, we don't have so much language for theology. We have great music. And so we talk about things, but we come at it from a very different angle. And we're talking once about the providence of God, and, and he's got all these great stories and, you know, talk, referencing all these things, and I'm listening, and, and uh, I said, you know, we have a phrase in the charismatic church about all this. He goes, oh, what is that? I said, well, we sum it up this way, favor ain't fair. He laughed. He's like, are you serious? Said, yeah, we say that, favor ain't fair, because it's true. When you see somebody like Joseph who receives a picture from God and has favor on his life, it's hard to explain why Joseph. It's not the oldest. It's not the youngest. Like, why Joseph? Why did he receive favor? Because favor is not fair. And the sooner you make peace with that, the sooner that you will be comfortable with other people receiving favor, and the sooner you will realize that when you get favor, it wasn't really because you earned it. Favor's not fair, but it's also not without any strings attached. The favor of a life is upon them for the purposes of the kingdom. Now, it might feel awesome when something wonderful happens to you that doesn't happen to other people, but let me break your heart. That isn't even about you. That's about you accomplishing purposes in the kingdom. When you receive favor, some unmerited thing that comes upon you in a blessing, the first question is not, what did I do to deserve this? Your first question as a believer should be, what is this for? Why did I receive favor in this situation? Favor has always been for the purposes of God, not for the comfort of the one who receives favor. Psalm 90, 17. This is in context to what God is doing on the earth. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. If I am favored, if I get a break anywhere, if I get noticed in a way that I shouldn't have got noticed, well, the next question is, okay, Lord, unto what? What is this for? Joseph had firsthand experience with favor at two levels. He had two different kinds of favor on his life. First of all, Genesis 37, 3. Now Israel, this is his father, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. We all know the story. Joseph is dad's favorite. Okay, so he gets favor from his father, but he also had dreams of favor with God. Genesis 37, 5. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers... They hated him even more. It is easy to read God's dream for Joseph, place it into the context of his entire life, and say, well, of course, yes, we understand why his brothers bowed down to him. But, you know, they gave him, he gave them food. That makes sense to us now. But even that interpretation is too small. What do we learn here? Because favor is not fair from the perspective of others or long-term, even from our own perspective. Your godly dreams of favor are easily misinterpreted. Some of you are in seasons of favor right now. Hold those lightly and do not misinterpret them. When you receive favor from God, you can almost count on favor with men going out the window. It's, it's like it's a seesaw. If we read Genesis 37, 6 through 9, he tells them these dreams. Wise? Probably not, but he does it anyway. He said to them, hear the dream I've dreamed. Behold, there were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him. 
for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Joseph had favor, but he's a bit of a slow learner. (laughs) Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. In Joseph's dreams of favor, he accurately sees what's going to happen, but he doesn't see the context in which they're going to happen. And when they bow down to him, it will be in context. He literally saves their life. They're not doing this. They're not bowing down out of fear. They're bowing down out of gratitude. But he will pay dearly for the realization of the favor on his life. Nobody sees that right now. Others, other people will reap massive benefit because of the favor on Joseph's life. Nobody sees that right now. Everybody wants a glimpse of what God has for them. You get a picture of your future, a little bit of a snapshot, because the favor that God shows us, it looks so good, but it's not for us. Just like we talked about regarding holy imagination, always being about other people. An accurate dream from the Lord or a picture of your future will always involve the blessing or well-being of other people. Favor ain't fair, not to the one who misses the favor or even to the one that it falls upon. Because when it falls upon them, then now they have responsibility to leverage that for the kingdom. So interesting, the Bible says that even his father who favored him, okay, he was daddy's boy. Even his father was angry with him that he shared the dreams. It's like, you're my favorite, but you need to shut up. Because favor with God and favor with man rarely coincide. Let me just encourage you. Some of you are like, I got neither right now. Then now's a really good time for you to determine which of those two you want. Like, if you're struggling, you know, I don't know if God likes me. I don't know if people like me. Okay, well, then you got nothing to lose right now. Because there will come a time when people like you and it's going to cost you and you're not sure you want to pay the price. Joseph went through it really quickly. He went from being daddy's boy to even dad going, Joseph, enough with the dreams. This motivates some people to just quit dreaming. There's another reason that people quit dreaming, though. And it's really in the second snapshot of his life. Second snapshot is this. Your godly dreams will suffer disastrous setback. There's this dark adage that says, no good deed will go unpunished. Do you know it? Some of you have, have tried to do the right thing, you know, pulled back a bloody nub. It's like, oh, I tried to help. A common thing I've seen in my own life, in the life of friends and heroes of the Bible, when our eyes are set on something and we start to lay hold of the promises of God, you can almost anticipate a swift kick to the head from somewhere. Maybe it's warfare. Maybe it's godly resistance. Maybe it's relational strains. But the minute you start getting a picture of vision, there are people in your life and demons in the atmosphere that will say, who do you think you are, highly favored and blessed of God? It's like the fine print, the asterisk on the dream. I've got a dream for you. Terms and conditions may apply. Nobody reads the terms and conditions. Do you? You you spend like 1,200 bucks on an electronic gadget. You take it out. You throw away the paper. Nobody reads the terms and conditions. Terms and conditions and vision from the Lord include setbacks. And for Joseph, it starts immediately. Genesis 37, 28. Then Midian traders passed by. They drew Joseph up out of a well. They've thrown him in a well. They lifted him out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Drop down to verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So Joseph, the human being, God's favorite, starts to look like an old car who's got like nine names on the back of the title. You ever driven an old junker that nobody's bothered to title and you go title it, it's got like four names on the back of previous owners? That's that's Joseph's story. He got sold to the Midianites, Midianites sold me to to the Egyptians, and here I am. Was this what Joseph expected when he received a dream? Likely, this was not his interpretation. He probably imagined that the dream of his heart was that he would take over his father's sheep operation, all of his brothers would work for him, everything would be hunky-dory. But when we get a picture of God's future for us, our interpretation is almost always too small and too simple. 
Some of you have started to distance yourself from dreams God has given you because they were bigger and more complicated than you thought. You're like, I thought I had this figured out. No, you didn't. But it doesn't mean it wasn't the Lord. This is good for some of you when you realize that you're in Egypt. It's good to remember the darkest parts of your story because the dark parts of your story are still your story and there are happier parts to be written. And when you get to the happier parts, you will realize that those have shaped your life. Listen to a story by uh, Sam Chan the other day. I've never heard of this guy before. He's Indian. He was sent to the United States to go to Bible college and has gone on to be a, uh, a pastor's coach and a business consultant. He's wildly successful. But when he came to the U.S. to be a Bible college student, the family that sponsored him that first semester, the man lost his job and they wrote to him and said, we're no longer able to sponsor you. So here he was in the U.S. and he had no money. His first year of school was paid for, but he had to make money for school. He would do odd jobs. He had no money to eat. He said he would literally go to people's front door and knock on the door. When they'd answer the door, he'd say, have you ever sponsored a starving Indian child? And once in a while, they'd say yes. He goes, there's a starving Indian right in front of you. Can you help me? Or he'd offer to mow their yard, and they'd say, I can't pay you. He'd say, let me mow the yard for free. Can you give me a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? He literally lived that way for four years. He went on to uh, fall in love with a, a young girl who was white, and the Bible college didn't like the idea of an interracial marriage, and so they kind of banished him. Ten years later, they invite him to come back and be the Bible college president. He's wildly successful right now, and when people ask him about that season in his life, he says, you know, that was hard, but I look back and I don't know who I would be if I had not gone through that. He's like, I actually find that the Lord was with me in that, even though it was very hard. Ephesians 1.22, if this is true, we have to trust God through hard times. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. If all things are under his feet, then those seasons where you are pursuing the dream of your heart and you feel like you're getting your head handed to you, those days are under the authority of the Lord. And he can meet you there. I have wasted countless hours wrestling with the sovereignty of God. Like, countless hours. And this is how it usually goes. God, why did it have to happen that way? Because you wouldn't be who you are if that had not happened to you. Doesn't mean it was even all the Lord. It just means he doesn't waste a moment or a chapter in your story. T.D. Jake says, so though are many things I would have done differently, I submit to God's sovereignty and his purposes in my life, and I thank him that he brought me the way he brought me and gave me what he gave me when he thought I could handle it. Had Joseph not gone through this season of life, his dream from the Lord would never have been fulfilled. The painful part of that dream that we have is between receiving the dream and its realization. Snapshot number one, favor's not fair. Snapshot number two, you will suffer setbacks. Now would be a good time for it to turn good, wouldn't it? Sorry, it's only number three. Chapter, snapshot number three, your character will be tested. There are certain people who are wired to take matters into their own hands. Are you one of these people? Like you just don't like to wait? Or when, waiting, see, when you decide waiting is stupid, you just take matters into your own hands? Okay, Nick, all right. We were in college, and we're in Walmart, and I'm waiting to get a key made. And there is not a human being alive in this store who seems interested in making a key. And so I stood there for a while, and finally I just decided to take matters into my own hands. There's a phone hanging on the wall, and I had watched people make announcements on that phone. So I just picked it up, and I could hear the mic go live, and I said... There's a customer in the key department who needs some help because he's about to try to use the machine himself. <laughs> help came out of everywhere. It was like unbelievable how many people were willing to help me make a key. Sometimes taking matters into your own, own hands pays off. Not so much in the kingdom. In the kingdom, when favor is on you, even as you press past setbacks, there will be a season 
of testing that is not just to rattle you, it is to form you. And it usually involves a testing of your character. Genesis 39, 1 and 2. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had, brought him, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who brought him down there. The Lord is with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of the Egyptian master. Now this may sound like the quickest turnaround of fortunes in history, but he still was a slave. There were three categories of slaves in ancient Egypt. There were forced labor of citizens for projects, so they could conscript citizens. They could draft citizens to build things. They did it all the time. They were a slave until the project got finished. Then there were those that were indebted slaves, where they, uh, they, had, they had a debt. They had to work off that debt, and they were slaves for a season. But then there were those who were chattel slaves that were sold like goods, and they were slaves for life. Joseph found himself in that third category. He was a lifer. He had been hauled in a cage with, or with his hands tied behind him on the back of a camel all the way to Egypt. He found himself on the auction block, not sure what's going to happen next, and he ends up in the palace. You could almost hear him going, this must be the fulfillment of my dream. Here I am in the palace, because that's what you think when you're young and green. You think it's going to be easy. It wasn't long until Joseph discovered that between your dream and the fullness of it, there are tests along the way, often tests of your character. And the purpose of the tests of those character are to determine whether you have what it takes to carry the favor of God. Not many chapters after this, Joseph is in charge of the economics and the agriculture of the most developed culture of the world. But he doesn't just get there because he had a dream and said yes. He gets there because in addition to having a dream, he proves himself trustworthy. And he proves himself trustworthy in how he responds to an opportunity to sin. God does not trust Joseph with the appetite of a nation until he knows that he can deal with his own appetites for sin. God will not trust you with the fulfillment of your dream until he knows he can trust you with your own appetites for sin. Genesis 39, 6 and 7. So Pharaoh left everything in Joseph's charge. Because of him, he had no concern of anything but the food that he ate. And Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. She does not want to take a nap, okay, without getting it any more graphic than that. Understand, she's not looking to cuddle. This isn't just about sex, though. This is about power. She's manipulating him, but he may have just as easily have manipulated her. In fact, Joseph could have said, this is the interpretation of my dream. Think of the power that I might have if I'm sleeping with his wife. What if Joseph saw Pharaoh's wife as the fulfill, a way to achieve his dream? What if he thinks, I could sacrifice my principles here, but I could achieve the things that God has put before me? That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? You may think that's far-fetched, but never underestimate the power to justify sin, even to accomplish what God has put in your heart. God does not need your help to accomplish what he has put in your heart. And he certainly doesn't need you to sacrifice your principles to do it. When you start with the end in mind, the fullness of the dream of God, it means your steps along the way have got to honor God as well. Compromise is never the path forward to God's dream for you. In fact, it's always the path somewhere else. So snapshot number one, favor's not fair. Snapshot number two, you're going to suffer setbacks. Snapshot number three, your character is going to be challenged. Snapshot number four, unjust accusation. You know, I've been confronted with things before that I have done. It's painful. Nobody likes to be confronted or accused of what they've done. But I've also been confronted by things I actively avoided doing. That's actually worse. I, I was just reading through this morning, and it was just true reminded me that some years ago, somebody prophesied over me. They said, you will be accused of what you specifically did not do. And I thought, well, that's going to stink. 
it did. And that's what he goes through here. To abbreviate Joseph's journey, he rebuffs this woman who approaches him and tries to manipulate him. He chooses not to advance his own cause or satisfy his own passions. As much as you would hope he gets rewarded for this, he actually gets punished. He displays his principles, and then she accuses him of doing what he actively did not do. When you are falsely accused, you are in good company. It's painful. Nobody likes to be misunderstood or maligned or being accused for things that they did not do. But you are honestly never closer to understanding the experience of Jesus than when you are accused of things that you did not do. As a child, Jesus was considered an enemy of the state. He was a friend of Israel. He was accused of being demon-possessed. He was full of the Spirit. He was accused of violating the law. He's like, I came to fulfill the law, you guys. Even Jesus gave us a heads up that we'd be accused of things that we actively chose not to do. And he said how it would feel to us is how it felt to him. John 15, 18, he says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Matthew 5, 11, he said, blessed are you. He's actually, it's going to be a good thing. When they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on my account. And Joseph embraces this and goes to prison over this. Now, having been thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, put in Pharaoh's house, now back into prison. At some point, he's got to go, the dream must have died. Like, how does this happen from here? He's had quite the journey. He's been dad's favorite. He's been Pharaoh's favorite. He's been Potiphar's wife's favorite. And now he's rotting in a cell, having done nothing wrong, except maybe talked a little too much as a kid. The Bible tells us he's in there for the neighborhood of 10 years a tithe of his life and at one point he thinks he's getting out because he interprets a dream and that door gets slammed in his face and he sits there wondering what was this dream all about what was the picture that God gave me when I was younger and I saw that I didn't ask for that but when it came to me what was that all about did I set myself up for disaster because I was a dreamer some of you have asked yourself if you set yourself up for disaster because you were a dreamer and you dared to dream. And if you look at Joseph, in a sense, once you started to dream, oppression coming against you is a natural spiritual act, but it doesn't mean the dream was wrong or it doesn't mean the dream is dead. No, Joseph, you are right where you are supposed to be because in due time, another dream will be given to Pharaoh, and you will interpret that dream, and you'll come out of prison, and in serving that dream, your dream will come to pass. At the end of your life, you realize that even the dream that God has put in your heart was never about you. It was always about the purposes of God for other people. Snapshot number five. We'll close with this. Is the dreams actually fulfilled? I want to ask if Jenna would join me for a moment. In time, Pharaoh has dreams of his own, and Joseph is called to interpret them. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and in doing so, he shows himself to be full of the Spirit of God. Pharaoh is amazed at how he can interpret these dreams. You are never more valuable to people than when you're helping them achieve their dreams. Whether it's your spouse, or your kids, or your boss, or your customers, or your community. When you are helping others achieve what God has put in, in their mind, you suddenly have great value. Years go by. Joseph takes on the agriculture and the economy in the country that held him captive. And they're successful beyond their wildest dreams. It's so big that even when there are no crops being produced in Egypt or the Mideast region, there is plenty where Joseph has been in charge. Because of this, Joseph's own father sent his brothers to go to Egypt to find food. The passage is kind of funny. Genesis 42, 1 and 2. When Jacob learned there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, what do you keep just looking at each other for? It's like, what are you just sitting around here for? Go to Egypt to get food. This starts a chain of events 
that brings Joseph's brothers, his hate-filled, jealous brothers who caused him great pain, back into his world where because of the favor that was on Joseph's life, they bow to him and he saves their life. Why did Joseph have favor from the time he was a child? Because as an older man, he would be called upon to save the lives of those who persecuted him. Let me charge you. There are people in your life that have hurt you and they've hurt you badly. Don't burn bridges. Because there may be favor on your life that may be for the sole purpose of their salvation. Through the rest of the story, all 11 brothers of Joseph bow before him in context of their receiving food and being reconciled to him. Joseph had a hundred opportunities during the course of his life to write them off. But he never does because of the favor on his life. He realizes it's not for them. Not for him, it's for them. I want to challenge you to ask the favor on your life, who is it really for? Who's it really for? Inasmuch that the Lord has given you the ability perhaps to generate finances, what is that favor for? Who's it for? Inasmuch that the Lord has given you favor before people, some of you have great favor. It's unexplainable favor before other people. What is that for? Is that so everybody knows you? Some of you have great favor with being able to get things done. It's everything you put your hand to just works. Is that only for your own good? No. It is for the greater good, and I would say even for the good of people who have hurt you. I can confidently say that in as much as the Lord blesses the bridge, there will come a time when we are in, call, in turn called to minister to people who have hurt us, and it will be a test of the favor on our lives. We determine now we want to walk in the full blessing of that, the fullness of it. Stand with me if you would. Father, we're just going to go back into worship for a couple of minutes here, and we ask that you would rest upon us with your favor for the purposes of your kingdom far beyond us right now. Let's just go to him and worship.
Sally and Tyler can come down and help me real quick. And Grenzis. We're just going to continue in worship here. If you need to go, you need to grab kids, you do whatever you need to do. But I don't want to miss this opportunity. There's a sense of tenderness in people's hearts this morning. Some of you are somewhere in the middle between the vision and the realization. And you're like, I'm snapshot two, three, or four. Like, I am under the gun here. I didn't realize when I said yes to a, to a dream that there was so much pain. We want to pray for you and encourage you to stand fast. That fulfillment is coming. And it is bigger and more grand than you can imagine. So this morning, as the band just continues to play, we're going to worship. You're free to go. We're not going to have a formal ending here. But if you would like prayer, you're in the middle of this. You're like, I, I've been accused of something I didn't do. I feel the weight of carrying a vision. I don't even know what this is for. We want to pray for you. So, Father, we say, catch us up in your story. Put us anywhere. We'll serve. But we need the encouragement and the hand of the Lord in the midst of the battle. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer, one of us would love to pray with you. If you want to stand and worship, you're free to do that or you're free to go. God bless you.